Happy Friday. There we go. Let me try this again. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to your week weekends. It's okay. 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 I hope your first week went well for the students who just started third semester, third term, sorry, third term. Glad to see so many faces here. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to welcome everybody to the transition translational epidemiology series seminar series. Um, we had to take a brief hiatus last fall, but uh, hope to be back in full swing this semester. So I'm Heather McKay. I'm faculty in the department here. I'm one of the co-organizers for the seminar series, along with my colleague, Dr. Amy Chris, sitting right there, and uh, Dr. Uh, Derek Ng might be helping out as well. So before I go on to welcome um, Dr. D'Souza, just take a moment to introduce you to the um, initiative, the Translational Epi Initiative. For those of you who might not know about it, it was launched by the department in the summer of 2017 as an effort across all the tracks in the department to improve the translation of epidemiological results into better health outcomes. And it was based on ideas by Dr. Moises Sklo of our department who defined translational epidemiology as quote, an effective transfer of new knowledge from epidemiologic studies into the planning of population-wide and individual level disease control programs and policies. So the seminar series is only one part of the entire initiative. There's also a, a new class on translational epidemiology, which our speaker has organized um, and will hopefully talk a little bit more about today. Um, there is a website about the initiative. So I do um, suggest that everybody take an opportunity to look at it, especially our students. Um, we have some great recordings from the past couple of years. We had a great roster of speakers. Um, so you can listen to the recordings. We will have another great roster of speakers this coming year as well. So keep your eyes out for announcements about those. And with that, I would like to introduce our wonderful wonderful first speaker of the year, Dr. Amber D'Souza. Many of you know her, but for those of you who don't, Dr. D'Souza is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, specifically in the cancer epi track. Her primary research interest is in infectious diseases and cancer prevention. She currently leads a research program on HPV and related cancers and is a PI of the Max Wise Combined Cohort Study, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, her research has been cited as providing one of the top six advances in cancer research by the American Society of Clinical Oncology. She is an outstanding researcher educator, colleague, and friend, um, and most recently has developed this new course. So I think she will have a lot to tell us about translational epi. So I don't want to take any more time away from her. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Amber D'Souza. I love it. An introduction by a friend leads to applause. This is a great way to start a, a work talk. Um, Wonderful. Well, I'm excited to be here today and to kick off um, the translational series. Um, as Dr. McKay said, this is something a lot of us really care passionately about. And translational epi has a little bit of a different meaning to different people. It's not something many people describe themselves as, right? So I might say I'm a cancer biologist or I'm an infectious disease biologist or a biologist, uh, epidemiologist. <laughs> um, but many of us do translation within those other hats, and you often don't know that until you get into conversations with them. So hopefully, as part of this series, as you hear different people talk about the work they're doing and what translational epidemiology means to them, you can get excited about it, think about ways that you can bring it into your own research. So I wanted to start today um, by just giving a brief overview of how I think about translational epidemiology, um, and then I'm going to share my work, just because it's easier for me to talk to, but really just as a thread and example about how I think about translational epidemiology. Um, so there's different ways to define it. When you think about the word translational, just in general, that means relating to the application of basic or theoretical discoverment, the discoveries to something practical, right? And so as an epidemiologist, I think, well, everything I'm doing, right, <laughs> is to inform practical things. But there's the desire and then there's the actual. And what I want you to come out of this talk thinking is, I don't have to work in health policy to make my work translate, you know, to translate and be meaning. There is still ways to do it across the spectrum, whatever space you are working in. So what is translational epi? 
It's the effective transfer of new knowledge from the studies we do into, as an example, planning of programs or policies. So that's one way to be translational, taking something you're generating in your study and actually helping to communicate and have that data presented and inform a program or policy. It can also be applying knowledge from studies to techniques or tools that then address health needs. And it can be about communication. So you can have the best study in the world, and if it's written in a way only the most technical experts in your specific field understand, then it may not get to the people who need it. So it's also really about communicating that knowledge that we generate to the right people. Because if you're not communicating with them in a way they understand the information they need, then it's harder to inform options and policies. All right, so I decided to make a little graphic. Translational epi is something where you're not, there's not chapters in epi textbooks on it. So a lot of this, that's why I said people will have slightly different takes. But so I started with the framework of um, the 750 series that we teach people. Um, and if you look at these circles, um, right, in epidemiology, we try to answer why, how, who, and what about health-related questions. And epi classes have all of these things on the left side where we're looking at measurements, we're looking at populations, we're looking at study design, we're talking about causal inference. These are the epi principles that you're, you're normally focusing on in classes. And what the add-on is supposed to be here is how do you take all of those theoretical things that you're learning in class and how do you bring it to translation? And so I just made up this part on the right as some examples of ways you know, there's the idea of implementation, and we know implementation science is its own specific field, but there are a lot of opportunities for, the, uh, for us who aren't in implementation science necessarily to really try to make sure that the results of our research are as implementable as possible and that they can be applied to the right populations. So there are opportunities for us to inform implementation. Communication, as I mentioned, um, understanding the burdens, the risks of prevention, and communicating that. Um, people always love to finish papers talking about next steps. And I'm always like, what's the use of this sentence, right? This just means, please pay my next grant, right? We need further research on X. Throw away, like save the word count for something else. But that doesn't mean we don't think about the next steps. And we want, when we're analyzing our results, that's what the discussion should be, is actually the so what, what does it mean? How do I use this? And if it's not actionable and not giving you what you need in that study that you ran, then you want to take that and really think about it in the design for the next one of how am I going to design this to actually get the right answer, the answer meaning the right kind of data. You, of course, don't know what the answer is to that, but, you know, the right, um, collect the right data to be able to inform that. There's, of course, policy itself and trying to advocate and influence policy. And then there's working with community stakeholders, input and delivery. So these are just examples. That's not ex an exhaustive list. All right, a little more overview and background before we jump into some examples. So why? Why should you care? Why is it important? We are in public health. We're not in it for the money. We're in it because we want to make a difference. All right. And so if we want to make a difference, we want our results to be relevant, whether that's clinically relevant, um, it doesn't have to be clinical, but relevant in some way to the needs of those populations. We want our results to be used. We don't want to publish it and have two other students somewhere else read it, right? We want to provide it that it can be applied to populations of interest, incorporated into guidelines and regulations, et cetera. And so if that's our goal, and it's my goal, I want to make a difference and give people the data they need to inform these decisions, then that requires that my research is understood and I'm communicating it effectively to the right people and that I'm designing and analyzing the right research questions in the right study populations, collecting the right data needed. And I put this last one because I think it also needs to be collaborative. One person only has so many ideas and only understands, you know, one view. So no matter how intelligent and wonderful you are, I find that despite all the complexities of collaboration and there's difficult personalities and there's a million challenges that come into collaborations, but there's also so many benefits and multiple people talking over ideas. Um, if you want your results to truly be translational and really have impact, it does require input from other people, I think. Um, and so that's collaborations with other investigators, that's collaborations with other stakeholders. 
um, like community advisory groups and getting um, input to understand your questions from different perspectives. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? So I'm going to show the evolution of some of my own research in HPV, HIV, and COVID, showing examples of some of the work I've done and how I've tried to translate it. Now that's all in the backbone that, um, right? I'm an epidemiologist not funded to do translational work. These are ways that you take whatever you're doing and you try to make them impactful and translational. And I'm also going to show some examples of data center work and translation in that context. All right. And so I have one more overview slide, but this is again thinking about wherever you are in the spectrum from etiology all the way to the implementation. There are the types of studies I've done in each of these where I think I can try to translate. So if you're on the etiology and discovery side, what is that? That's studies like looking at molecular mechanism, descriptive EVI, natural history, and risk factor studies, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get into a space where you're doing more of risk communication, tools for stakeholders, evaluating um, biomarkers for screening or implementation or clinical use, um, and some data resource type work that's translational, creating data, um, resources. Um, and then there's actually like when you get to the strategies and policies and management, um, I put cancer because my work is in cancer here, but most epidemiologists are not working on the right side. Many people are working in the cross-sectional cohort, case control, risk factor side, which is more on the etiology discovery, but we can still make those studies more translational. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research now. Um, so I started my research here as a student at Johns Hopkins, looking at the question of uh, can HPV be a cause of oropharyngeal cancer? We knew at the time that it caused cervical and anal cancer. We thought it might be able to thro cause throat cancers, but we were unsure. So I enrolled 100 people with part of a whole larger group. Um, this is, you know, my work with many other people, including my PhD mentor. Um, 100 oropharyngeal cancer cases and 200 match controls. Um, and yes, we saw that people um, who had these cancers were much more likely to have oral HPV DNA and other biomarkers that we looked at, such as um, serologic antibodies, as well as surrogates for these markers, such as behavioral um, number of lifetime oral sexual partners. So we saw that there was the strong association between these markers of HPV and the odds of having oral pharyngeal cancer. Case control study suggests that HPV may cause oropharyngeal cancer. So that led to prospective studies. And I said, okay, well, if HPV can cause oropharyngeal cancer, what do we know about why people get this, how they get it, who can we screen, what happens with HPV? So I enrolled a cohort of young adults, 18 to 25, in STD clinics because they're going to be exposed, right, to any STD, including oral HPV. And I followed them every three months in a cohort study. And so I could calculate the incidence of new infection, right? 2% um, of participants acquired a new oral HPV infection every month. I could look and see what those differences were for different groups. Here I can compared heterosexual females and males and showed that men had a higher risk for the same number of partners of acquiring an infection than women, suggesting that there was a difference either biologically or based on who you're performing oral sex on. And I also saw differences in clearance, right? Natural history. Um, so that men were also less likely to clear oral HPV infection than women. So men have a higher rate of oropharyngeal cancer. We observe that in our clinical population. I now have a piece that is informing why. It's telling me, okay, is it just that men perform more oral sex than women, which is the risk factor for this cancer? And the answer is no. There's actually a difference per partner. If you have the same number of sexual partners and you're a man versus a woman, there is some difference here in your risk of getting this infection. And then there's double bad luck that if you're a man and you acquire the infection, you're also less likely to clear it. So that helps understand what we're seeing in our case population of why men are having this at a, this cancer at a higher rate than women. And we did other studies to help inform these risk factors. So, for example, it was really noticeable that there were a bunch of non-smokers getting this cancer in your head and neck when normally it was smokers getting all these oral cancers. And so we're like, who are these healthy men coming in that have never smoked and are getting this cancer? And so people were like, okay, was cancer protect, is smoking protective? Like, what is the situation here where there are these non-smokers getting cancer? But when you look 
at the people who have, um, if you look here, we used blood codeine, urinary NNNL, those are um, objective measures of tobacco exposure. And we also looked at number of lifetime sexual partners, all those risk factors for oral HPV. And you could see that no, having exposure to tobacco increased their risk for oral HPV, probably because of some inflammatory damage when you're smoking in those cells, making HPV more likely to, um, you know, remain when you're exposed or less likely to clear. So smoking is not protective, right? Um, it's just that if you don't smoke, you're not going to get the other head and neck cancer. So we don't see them in our patient population. There's their smokers getting oral cavity cancer. But here's another cancer, these HPV related oral pharyngeal cancers. And the risk for these is higher in smokers, but most Americans don't smoke and they're still at risk for this cancer. So most of our patient population are non smokers. So it's helping to differentiate what are the populations and what are their risks, which can then help inform prevention as well as helping to counsel those who have this cancer. So those are really natural history type studies, right? Not that translational, although they're answering questions that the patients were asking. But as I'm doing these cohort studies and I'm bringing people in and I'm collecting data, they're constantly asking questions, right? And I'm talking to them and I'm hearing them. And I'm thinking about their questions. So when I designed my next set of studies, they really were inspired by the questions I was getting from our patients and our participants. So for the people who got these cancers, there was such tremendous worry about them being infectious. Many of these people have been married 10, 15, 20 years to the same person, they would stop having sex. They'd be like, I have an STD. Now that could have been acquired 20, 25 years ago from a college girlfriend. Right? There's no reason. They've swapped whatever STDs they have long ago, but they're changing their behavior. There's people who were afraid to hug their children. Right? Can I get this by sharing a fork? All these questions that are coming, right? And, and we want to inform with data. What is the risk to other people around you of this cancer that is in the throat, right? Um, and their concern about salivary type exposure from it. There was also a big question of why. Why did I get this cancer, right? So you have something caused by HPV. HPV is an STD. So risk does increase with increased number of partners, but there's plenty of people who get this cancer who've had two partners, right? And so you can imagine their concern, right? And they felt like, why do I have this um, cancer? Did my partner cheat on me? Is it possible that I have this? What about if I've only ever had one partner and my partner has only ever had one partner and we get this cancer? What does that mean? <laughs> Is there another way to get it or did someone cheat? So we're hearing all these questions, why me? And there's no data to answer them. And then number three, from healthy people who are seeing, oh, oral pharyngeal cancer is increasing. It's increased 3% every year. I'm worried I'm gonna get it. My, my exact history is X, Y, Z. I'm now concerned about my own risk, but there's no screening available. What can I do? So you get these emails and calls, they make you think about it. And to me, this is part of translation is hearing the questions that people need and then giving them the answers to those questions. So for example, we designed a study where we not only enrolled our patients with oral pharyngeal cancer, but we brought in their spouses and we tested them also. Okay, you've been having sex for 15 years you've been married, your partner has cancer, you legitimately are concerned and wanna know, are you at increased risk? Well, we can collect some data and answer that. So for example, in this study, let's see if I can do the mouse. Oh, the mouse. Oh, here we go. I don't, no, you don't see it on the screen. That's okay, I'll just talk it through. So this is antibody levels for one of our cancer by HPV biomarkers, E6. Um, for the HPV-16 virus. And you can see the cases there have a very high median of the biomarkers and the partners, which are their spouses and long-term sexual partners, had the same level of seropositivity as healthy controls that we enrolled. No increased risk. Now, why would that be? Well, HPV is a very common STD. Most people are exposed in their life to some kind of HPV and clear it, no problem. So the fact that their partner had it and they may have been exposed, well, most people clear it. So they don't seem to have a very increased risk. It's a rare cancer. So even if their cancer risk is increased a little bit, we were able to answer their question that is it likely they will get this cancer? No, we don't see a common elevation. So that was super helpful to many of these partners that had really high levels of concern and zero data.
to inform whether they should be concerned or not. Um, okay, so here's a different kind of trying to translate. So I was getting calls, you know, every two or three days from people in the general population wa wanting answers. And there were no literature, no websites, just nowhere to send them. And again, part of this is that I was working in an understudied area, but whatever you're doing, there's always something that you're studying because it's interesting and novel. And so the thing is, how do you get that information to other people? So we were working in a space where the clinicians had been trained to help smokers and drinkers um, who were getting these cancers, and they were not comfortable talking about sex. <laughs> and they were getting these patients with HPV-related cancer, and they could not talk to them about it. They didn't know how to talk to them about it. It was a real problem. And I was going to these conferences trying to give some trainings as an STD epidemiologist about how to do it, and people were like, well, can you give me a handout? Can you give me some pointers, right, to take back with me? And I was like, yes, I can. So we wrote a paper for the providers, targeting our arms to the providers. Here's the science behind. Here's what we know, right? So you can explain it. And then we also created a brochure for patients and said, you can print this out and hand it to your, <laughs> to your patients if you are too uncomfortable to talk about this or if you just you know, want to support your verbal conversation with something in writing they can take home. And this actually um, got taken up by some uh, medical training groups where they were training their residents using uh, this because there were no other resources available. So to me, translation is partly just seeing where the vacuum is of needed things and then providing that information. And this is back in 2013. We do get email requests for updates, which I haven't had the bandwidth to do. But when you go to practitioner conferences in this space, there's a generation of people trained and aware of this data. It's no longer an issue. Practitioners in this space are comfortable answering these questions, right? There, there is the data and the information to answer this now. But at the time, we were filling an important void. OK. There were also getting a lot of questions from the public who did not have cancer. So the last slide was about something for people with cancer. I was getting the call. You know, I called a prostitute, I did X, or my partner cheated on me, I was exposed to Y, whatever their specific sexual situation was, I can't sleep at night, I'm sure I've like ruined my life and I'm going to get cancer, right? Um, whatever those situations were. And that translates into other risk factors, right? I happen to be an STD researcher, but whatever your area of research is, I was hearing the high level of concerns people were having, some of which, you know, were not, were not needed. Right, and so we created a FAQ on a web on the Hopkins website with just what we know, right? Answering these questions, and again, since there were not many resources, the hospital actually contacted us a year later, and they're like, "What's on your website?" It was our most highly hit, you know, page this year, and we're like, "What? Like this was a little side project that was supposed to stop our our phones from ringing. Like we could just send this link to those emails." But again, when you're Googling and there's no other resources, we were providing something people didn't have. All right. So then I put on the right some other examples, um, an NPR interview, again, lay communication about what we know, um, a CDC webinar, that's training um, uh, clinicians. In, in this case, it was about vaccination, HPV vaccination, so prevention. But this is, again, talking to stakeholders about what you know, communicating it out um, to try to impact your, your disease that you study. All right. So now going on in research, there was a lot of questions about risk for oral HPV, right? And so I thought, all right, we now have collected enough data. Let's create a risk graphic. And I was reading Newsweek, and they had this amazing graphic about cholesterol level. Um, and I was just like, God, this is so clear. This is like really such such good, I can look at this picture and see, am I at risk for heart disease? Am I high risk? Am I low risk? Like it's just so clear. And I was not trained to do this. I am not an artistic person. I like to sit and analyze my numbers in my database. Like that's what I'm good at, right? But I could just see how helpful it would be. So we used NHANES data. We had looked at oral HPV in NHANES in a nationally representative sample. Um, so a set of researchers had done, and so it was publicly available data. And so we just looked at this, and what we could show is that there really is some risk stratification. So for example, women have a much lower oral HPV prevalence than men. We had seen that across studies. They have a lower cancer risk, 
But here we could say, okay, whether you've had oral sex or never performed oral sex or, or had two partners, whether you've had five partners, the risk increases, but among women, the risk was low. So if you're a woman, don't worry about it, all right? The cancer risk for HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer is really low. And not surprisingly, commensurate with that, the levels of oral HPV infection are super low. So you can see it's less than a percent of women in the general population have this. So in men, if we look at, at by number of oral sexual partners, and we also look by smoking to stratify, you can see our highest risk group. So if you look at men who have had five or more lifetime sexual partners and you smoke, 15% of them in the general population had an oncogenic prevalent oral HPV infection in that moment, and 4% had HPV-16, the kind most, most likely to cause cancer. Okay, so that's pretty high for a rare cancer. Now, most people are going to clear HPV. It's not like we need to immediately intervene. And you say, well, five sexual partners, that's not that high. And that's true. There's people who have plenty more, and it continues to risk stratify. But when you look at the population, a lot of the U.S. population is between two and 10 sexual partners. So the point here is that communicating to the general population in terms of risk groups, we summarize those groups most likely to be meaningful. Okay, policy and implementation. Now, I don't work that much on the policy side, but there are opportunities in whatever you do. So here's one example that, right, I'm studying my little cancer, HPV and oropharyngeal cancer, publishing on it, and I got an email, like, Surgeon General's report, bringing a report on oral health, we've never had a section on HPV, it's cancer is increasingly common, we think we need a section. Will you write a section? I was like, yes, I will absolutely do that, right? So that then gets included in a document that helps to inform um, what people are talking about in the needs and policies for oral health. Okay. So I talked about some steps that led from my research, but in any um, road that you go, down, go on, you need to continually think about what it is. And sometimes we kind of went back to some more um, research that's less transnational to just sit and analyze risk factors and understand a question that then again might lead to something translational. So even if that's your interest in having impact, you can't, you, most of us will not always work in that space unless that's your specialty. So that was certainly the case for me. And so I'm showing an example here where I really tried to follow what the data showed me. And so one of the big questions we had was about racial and sex-based disparities in our infections and in our study, in our um, cancer cases. And because many of the people looking at this were clinicians or molecular people, they weren't coming from an epi framework. Because to an epi audience, you're like, well, yeah, you look at race and sex-based differences. Like, isn't that epi 101? Like, who's not going to look at that? But that's not what everybody's trained to do. And instead, there's a lot of case series where 90% of the participants were white men, so they just dropped everybody else or just included them all, and we really only had the studies on white men. So we thought, okay, this needs to be done. All right, so I went back to the etiology and discovery and did some risk factor type uh, questions. Um, and so here's three papers, and I'm gonna show you some quick updates in this kind of question, looking at, again, this motivating question that we had in oral HPV infection, in cancers, and in prognosis, looking at these differences. Um, so here's the first one, understanding disparities. We wanted to know why is oral HPV more common in men and white men specifically? Um, and there was also this generational change that um, we could see that oral HPV infection was more common now than it was before and cancer was more common than it was before. And people always ask me, what is it? Is it just the hippies and their oral sex? Is it just that? Like why, why? right? What's going on? So there's a lot going on in this figure, I know, but I'll just walk through some highlights. So the blue and the red line at the top are just how common it is to ever have oral, ever perform oral sex in your life by generation. And basically, it's common. It doesn't matter which generation you are. The baby boomers, most of them ever performed oral sex in their life. Right now, maybe it was just with one partner or two partners, but it's common. Most people at each age. Um, have this risk factor of performing oral sex. Now, if you look at the little squares and triangles, those were differences by race. They're super different. <laughs> there are huge racial differences in oral sexual practices, which is super interesting because there's all these racial differences that we saw in the incidence of HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer. And, you know, it was a question. Is it different in oral sex? Is it difference in a cofactor of smoking? Is there something genetic? Like, what is it? Nope, it's oral sex. 
If you control for the behavior that acquires this STD, you control for the cancer. So when we looked at our Black and Hispanic participants that were performing oral sex, their odds of having oral HPV were the same as the white participants who were performing oral sex. So this helped explain something that we couldn't tell at the cancer stage, that it is the behavior irrespective of race. Now the true was not same for sex as I showed you in the natural history. It actually, whether you're male or female, there is a difference per partner. So as we studied this story, we explained the racial disparities explained by a behavioral difference, but the gender disparities not. Um, okay. So we also wanted to know why are most cases in white men? Uh, again, the same question. So here we were looking at people who actually had oropharyngeal cancer, and we looked at the percent of cases with oropharyngeal cancer that were caused by HPV, because the clinicians kept saying, we're seeing, you know, men. This disease, HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer, is a disease of men because, like, the vast majority of their patients were men. And when we looked at the female participants, and we had to enrich for them across our study sites, we went back and did retrospective testing across multiple sites, got together a big group. Over time, you can see we used um, bank tumor samples from 1995 to 2012. What we showed is, no, the same thing is happening in women. It's just missed because they're a smaller proportion of your population. So among the women or pharyngeal cancer, back in the 90s, only 25% were caused by HPV. But in 2010 to 2012, we're up to 70%. Most oropharyngeal cancers among women are caused by HPV just like they are among men. And that really makes sense because this is an STD that people transmit back and forth, right? It wouldn't make sense for only men to have it. Um, but this hadn't been understood that this rise was happening in women. And it took a little while for the increase in oropharyngeal cancer incidence in women to be large enough to really show up as an annual increase because at the same time we were having decreases in tobacco use that were decreasing the number of tobacco related oropharyngeal cancer so the total number wasn't rising. But now we're at a point where the tobacco ones have increased and the HPV related ones continue to increase and you're seeing it not just among men but among women in the US. Um, and so we also looked at the same thing among uh, other racial groups which again hadn't been powered for stud or studied in other in other places. And we saw that every single racial group had this increasing percent of cancers caused by HPV. And you can see the absolute magnitude is different among black individuals and other individuals due to differences in sexual behavior, but that more than half the oropharyngeal cancers among every racial group are now caused by HPV. And the fact that it was very high in Hispanic and Asians was really new information. Okay, um, so it increased in every group 95% of men and 78% of women with oropharyngeal cancer in our most recent period, 2013 to 2019, were, were caused by HPV, which is just really dramatic for those of us who, you know, I ha I'm not that old yet, right? It's like 15, 20 years ago, we didn't even know if this, H this virus caused this cancer, and it's now causing almost all of them in the US. We don't see this in every setting, in settings with a lot of tobacco smoking cancers. It can be a lower proportion, as you all know, because got a, the denominator matters. OK, so again, I went a little bit back to the risk factor data and used that to really inform some important gender and racial sex-based differences, um, which we found really useful. And then there were a series of policy questions needing data that we kind of pivoted to. All right. So some of those questions, for example, were how to screen for oropharyngeal cancer. There was a lot going on with screening for cervical cancer, which involved HPV. And they're like, well, can we just do the same thing and bring it into the oral pharynx, which seemed like a really good question. And then also, well, what about the HPV vaccine? We've been vaccinating people for more than 10 years. Like, when are we going to see the impact? All right, so here's some snippets um, from that. So the first one, um, dentists were asking about HPV testing all the time. And the reason that they're asking is because people were coming in, some of them were being marketed by these small companies that had started up and were selling um, salivary DNA tests to them. These were not FDA approved. There was no data supporting whether they were or weren't useful, but they were marketing them both to dentists and to individuals. And people started getting tested and then getting a result saying they were positive and no one could tell them what that meant and there was no action treatment because there is no therapy for HPV to make it go away. So there's quite a bit of harm. Um, and so this was a real problem, honestly, in the field. 
and the dental colleagues didn't know because it was hard to know how good these tests were. So the uh, American Dental Association formed together a group, a panel that I was a member of, and um, you know, we reviewed all of the literature that there was to try to decide, well, are any of these tests good? Maybe some of them are validated and maybe some of them do have utility. Um, and so this group kind of looked at all the adjuvants around a range of questions. But of course, here I'm highlighting recommendation six, that the panel did not recommend commercially available salivary adjuncts for the evaluation of precancers um, among healthy patients, basically, because the test didn't work. <laughs> and so not only did they not, were they not validated, and there was also no therapy, which is a huge ethical second, but there also was no data supporting utility. Um, so this really helped having a central organization giving a clear recommendation to their members. Um, so that's something I could have never done on a website, right, or, or a paper. That was me taking the time. I had to fly to Chicago in the winter. I had to, you know, sit in these panels. Um, it was time. It was time. It was unpaid time, right? But I found it really rewarding because I was getting calls from the people whose dentists gave these tests, and they were hysterically alarmed when they were positive, and there was nothing to do for them. There's no follow-up test they can order, there's no therapy, and I really, I felt it was harmful. So um, this is again collaboration, working with other people. There were myself and one other epidemiologist in the room, so especially participating in groups where you're sometimes the, there's not a lot of you there, <laughs> um, right? That can be difficult. It can be really invigorating though, once you can understand the way the other people like, you know, get on the same page and, and advocate. Um, but I think it really led to some beautiful things. And I'll share just to go a little bit off the thing. One of the clinicians who was in that group enjoyed it so much that every year he emails a group of us just like what science he thinks is interesting in the area. Just like it's been 10 years. I still get this. Well, because it was published in 2017, but I think we started the work in 2015. Just just sharing with other colleagues these intellectual thoughts about the field and you know, I don't have the bandwidth to do that, but every year I think, oh, this really meant something to him, and he really felt the way I did, that you got a group of people from different backgrounds contributing in the same way, and he wants to re-engage around that, you know, each year in some, in some email. But, okay. So, listening to policy questions needing data. All right, so here's another example. All right, and so this one was, can we use the HPV tests that we're doing for cervical cancer screening for oropharyngeal cancer screening? Um, and so first there's this graphic looking at, well, the tests that were used for cervical cancer were screening for a few oncogenic HPV types, a few different HPV types. And that's because like half a cervical cancer is caused by HPV 16 and another 25% is caused by HPV 18. And then there's like three more that cause the next 10%. So you need to include several HPV types to get at a high proportion of cervical cancer. But that's not true for oropharyngeal cancer. For oropharyngeal cancer, which is the bar on the left, about 92%, um, definitely over 90%, are caused by a single HPV type, HPV 16. So that's the type we care about. More than 90% of the cancers, the oropharyngeal cancers, are caused by HPV 16. Now, if you screen, we took an NHANES population and said, well, how common of all the HPV infections you're detecting with your pan HPV test, what percent are HPV 16? Um, and you can see it's 20%. So the take home here was you really do a lot of harm if you screen for all oncogenic types for oropharyngeal cancer because 80% of the people that you are detecting as positive with your oncogenic probe have a super low risk, 8% of their oropharyngeal cancers. It's already a rare cancer. And now we're screening to 8% of a rare cancer really low risk so that if we were going to screen with one of these HPV tests, you'd really want to only act on the HPV 16s. That's the test. Um, so that's a really important point if we ever move forward to screening here. Um, and then we looked at different tests and combinations with antibodies and co-testing, sensitivity, specificity, all of this trying to, you know, look at our biomarkers and answer these questions of if we test, how should we test? Now, I did mention that there's a huge thing of we can't treat. So that's a whole separate question of even if you find biomarkers that good, that are good and identify someone at high risk, if you have nothing to offer them, I still don't know if you want to screen them. So, but it is important to understand the screening algorithms in case effective interventions are developed so we know who to screen in that case. Okay. Um, and then we, we worked in the policy area. Uh, sorry, in the vaccine area. 
so this is, was work led by one of my PhD students, Jennifer Zhang. Um, and this honestly came from a conference where I was there at the conference and all the cervical cancer people at the HPV conference were doing this amazing modeling around the vaccine. And just, you know, cervical cancer is much more common. There's many more people working in that space. So no one was doing it for the other HPV cancers. And I was like, well, I want to know when we're going to see it for orpharyngeal cancer. So um, this modeling showed, so on the left, we're looking at the rate of oropharyngeal cancer and what we predict the benefit of vaccine is going to be on the overall rate of oropharyngeal cancer. And you can see the difference in the dotted line and the solid line is barely perceptible, okay? Really hard to see. Um, now, if you, why? Right? Why? If you look at the right and you look by age, you can see at the bottom in blue that we start to get to the ages. The 36 to 45 year olds start to have people because you're vaccinated 11 who are aging into that age group. And you can see we're actually going to reduce half of the oropharyngeal cancers in that group by 2045 from people who have already been vaccinated today. But when you get into the older age groups, they haven't been vaccinated and you can see most of the burden of cancer is there. So the total number of cancers are driven by the older people and the older people have not been vaccinated. So the really sobering take home is no, by 2045, we're not seeing less orpharyngeal cancers. The clinicians are not going to be out of business for orpharyngeal cancer, 2045 business is still increasing, but we will eventually see this. These, there's other papers that projected all the way out to 2100 and show how amazing those benefits are. We didn't want to trust the assumptions of the model for, you know, 80 years. That's a bit much, but, you know, there are sustained improvements and we, we clearly are beginning to see those benefits. Okay, so I think I'm almost out of time. So to end, I'm going to just go forward with a few other things I wanted to share. Here, I had a resident who was working with me that was super interested in helping patients make a decision between a radiation therapy option and a surgical option. And they had equipoise clinically. So, you know, it was like, these both work, which do you want? And patients were like, um, what? Like, how do I supposed to make this decision? And so we actually did this spiral design with these qualitative interviews and collecting information and, you know, designing communicating the information in the way they wanted. And we did participant uh, interviews to talk patient to patient about their experiences with the different modalities. Um, it, was, it was really exciting and is available on the website for, for patients to use to help them make these decisions. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna do a few examples of COVID. What time am I supposed to end so I can gauge it? One. Perfect. All right, let me do 10 minutes on COVID. All right, so, um, Here's some examples for around COVID and translation. So one is risk communication. Um, so you may have seen articles like this. When 500 epidemiologists expect to fly, hug, blah, 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 they literally surveyed epidemiologists about their perception of different behaviors and when they could travel, um, which was super interesting, but it was this question of risk communication. And these were infectious disease epidemiologists. And then they collated that data to try to, in the lay press, uh, they did a series of this, this with the New York Times. Um, here's another one, when, when the epidemiologists are gonna send their children to school. It was super interesting. And they had individual quotes about how to measure the risk metrics as communicated by epidemiologists. Um, and then you can see like our website, this was the Hopkins website, traveling in a pandemic. Again, like trying to communicate out some of these risk metrics um, effectively. Yeah. All right. Here's another example. All right, so very early, March 2020, um, we wanted to provide information on infectious disease epidemiology and outbreaks to the public. And we decided to create a class for free and put it on Coursera to just get the word out. And we already had some lectures about general epi surveillance outbreaks, things like that, that we could pull some modules together. And so I just taped new lectures at the beginning of each section being like, okay, epidemic curves, here's your lecture on epidemic curves, and here has how it applies to COVID and, you know, to today's outbreak um, in each section. Okay, so we launched this and 100,000 people enrolled. It was amazing because, again, it was filling a question that people were asking at a time that they were asking. Um, oh, here were just examples of topics, understanding outbreaks, identifying cases, characterizing the cause, right? risk factors, things, surveillance, um, things you guys are very familiar with. 
Oh, nope, you don't need to see it. Okay. <laughs> there um, all right, here's another example, herd immunity. So um, Rush Limbaugh published something 2020 saying we've reached herd immunity. It's not a problem. And David Dowdy, who's another faculty member in my department, was like, have you seen this quote? Because he's super savvy on social media. I was like, I haven't seen it. So we read it. We're like, well, we don't agree, right? It's three months into the epidemic. We haven't had that many cases. Um, let's write an opinion piece and send it to the Washington Post. So we sent something up, and, and the Washington Post was like, they, did, they rejected it. They're like, no, no, thank you. They had their own piece coming out about something related, I guess. So we just said, all right, well, we spent the time. We spent three days of our life sitting and editing this. Like, let's ask the Hopkins website if they'll put it up. So they did. And it became a frequent site that people were visiting because herd immunity, who knew, continued to be a topic for two years. And we actually had to keep updating it because information changed, right? And so we had just created the side piece, taking two days of our life, but because people were still referencing it, asking questions, et cetera, we actually ended up updating it three times. Uh, so you can see uh, an example of an update we had to do September 21, rethinking herd immunity, <laughs> the COVID response endgame, right? Because <clears throat> things were changing. So that is something that happens in translation is you spend time and energy communicating something, but you do have to think about the accuracy of that and do you take it down when information changes or do you spend time to re-update? Okay, percent positive. Um, so this was another thing um, that began, people were asking a lot about percent positive and it wasn't clear. So we ended up um, putting up an explanation of what this was on the Hopkins website. It helped people understand, you may remember during the COVID epidemic, um, some states were using that to track when certain preventive measures would or wouldn't take place. So some of these measures actually became really important and people didn't understand which metrics to use when. So like I was helping to inform some schools and they'd be like, which measure should we be following, <laughs> right? Like, what do we care about? And so just helping to message and explain an epi term like this. Um, so again, this is, I didn't get a grant to study percent positive. This is just like a question people are asking. I know the answer to this. I think I can help by explaining this. All right. Um, and then I wanted to end, uh, you know, being trained at Hopkins, you see a lot about cohorts. Um, and so, as you know, I helped run the data center for the Max Wise um, combined cohort study. Here's two pictures of us, our 13 study sites on the map. But just to show examples that even within a very traditional observational research study, there are chances to do, you know, translational type research. So here's three studies I will talk about. So the first one was we merged. We had two separate cohorts, the MAX cohort and the WISE cohort, and we merged. And I was like, wow, no one knows what our new study population is. And I lead in the data center. I'm going to be getting an email every single day. How many people do you have with diabetes? How many people do you have under 40? How many, right? Like just what is even our study population? So I'm like, this is going to be useful for me and the researchers who want to do research, I am going to just characterize our population. So for example, I just was like, here's what we have in our biorepository. This, these are samples, we have them, we want you to use them. We have 40 years of serum and plasma and urine and cells, like come and get. It. And here's how they are by men and women and HIV serostatus, right? Um, here is how our population represents the United States population living with HIV, so you can, you know, where you can and can't use us as a representative population. And then we also talked about lessons learned in our merging. Um, and this was actually specifically asked for by a bunch of people um, because it was so hard merging two cohorts with such a long history and there, there were a lot of lessons learned. So this is not research as I normally do research. It's really not. Um, and it's also harder to publish something like this, honestly, um, that it's descriptive, but it's been so useful to everybody who wants to study our population and doesn't even know who they are and how they are. So this is a very different type of translation. I'm not impacting health care. Health, I am impacting research doability to then impact health because people understand what we have, what they can propose, what they can study. So I'm facilitating research. Um, now here's an example that's a little more applied. Um, I was at an HPV meeting. I had been doing cervical HPV research in the WISE study for 10 years, and I felt like I have made contributions. I have published 10 papers on cervical HPV. 
And I'm at a small group of people interested, focused on cervical HPV in people with HIV. And some of the policy NIH type people were like, it's such a shame that we do not know X, Y, Z, right? Because the guidelines had changed. We used to have annual screening in the general population. They'd gone to every three screening for general population women. And they're like, well, we don't know how to screen women with HIV. It's such a shame that there's no data. And I'm like, what do you mean there's no data? Like my one little study I'm part of alone has all these papers, the data's all there. And they're like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. And the problem was really the way that we were generating the data. We were generating kind of research hypothesis by research hypothesis, right? And it was not synthesized. It was not usable to them. It wasn't communicated in a way that they could inform their guidelines. So I came back, I had a brilliant graduate student, Hillary Robbins, and I was like, here's our problem. Like, we need to figure out a way to communicate this to, to policyholders in a way they can understand. So we brainstormed a lot. Um, anyway, came up with this modeling way of making risk metrics. So example, for example, these three lines that you see in dotted blue, the line for colposcopy, the line for six to 12 month return, and the line for rescreen are based on healthy women in the general population. Of the level of precancer risk in those populations that require each of those action items in the general population. And we're like, all right, we are going to model the risk in our women by their HIV status and plot that against here and then imply what should be their care um, for a similar level of risk. So for example, the immunosuppressed women had 16.4% risk of precancer within three years. So that suggested um, they might need immediate colposcopy. That is that uh, top group. But the other women who had fairly good um, immune control their level of risk was much more like come back for a follow-up pap in six to 12 months. And that was all among women who had ASCUS pap, which is a low-grade abnormality. And we did this for each kind of pap result, right? So it was just, again, trying to benchmark their level of risk to another population that people understood to help inform the guidelines. And this ended up being used by the colposcopy um, program at their 2019 guideline meetings because they were like, look, we have a table of data to use and inform our guidelines. How great. And um, that was super exciting for us. Hillary and I were texting each other that night. You can imagine. All right. Um, and then a the last example, again, I'm trying to show you different kinds of things. So here we just wrote a paper. This is the three leaders of the data center of the Max Wise Combined Cohort Study. All our professors in epidemiology here, um, Liz Topper, Stephen Gangey, and myself, about the changing science of HIV epi in the US. Right. Um, and so really trying to synthesize for people a little bit of like a thought piece about the key changes in populations in HIV, the refinements in measurement and what was coming. This was really like, why are we still studying this? You've had this cohort 40 years. Why more? Right. Um, and so um, that's not what they taught me in the epi series when I took the epi series here. Right. But again, following the questions and the needs of your research area to inform. Um, oh, here's other examples. So just as part of that paper, you can also see we benchmark certain UN AIDS benchmarks to where things were in the US and the globe and talked about our cohort within that context. Um, and where the gaps in HIV care continuum were so very much alike 40 years into our study. Here's where things are in HIV. All right. So I hope that today this has kind of inspired you to think about other ways to be involved in translational work. And that um, in addition to your research and making it communicative and thinking about your study design, you can also um, volunteer to be on advisory boards like guideline committees. You can join task force. I'm in the Maryland Commission on Public Health right now. Um, you can do advocacy, join advocacy groups and, and NGOs. You can also join professional societies. There's a lot that goes on there that's translational. And the take home is that you can incorporate translational thinking into your research whether that's in design, implementation, communication, or hopefully all three. Um, and I wanna end by saying that we do have a new fourth quarter class. It's a seminar class, it's really exciting. Um, we're excited to launch it. Um, it is 3.30 to 5.20 on Mondays. It is for PhD students and DRPH students, and it is in person. Um, but you can see the kind of topics that we are um, going over and we have a huge range of different teachers um, with specialties in each of these areas. It's not just me. Um, it's a whole team of people with different expertise coming to inform and talk about the class. Great. 
and I will pause and welcome questions.